And Gardner was a great inspiration for our group. Uh, he framed it and kind of um, pushed us. And one of the things that he did in 2009 is he wrote an essay and he presented up at Open Ed, uh, this thing called Personal Cyber Infrastructure. The idea of which became the basis for DS-106. Uh, very quickly, it was the idea that students should be sysadmins of their own education. They should set up their own web host, have their own domain, and start experimenting and building their own sites, and then we aggregate them into some central space. Well, that aggregation and kind of um, technical part is something we built on, but the kind of conceptual part of students controlling and maintaining their own data is something that was you know, really important to the class and really important to the beginning of it. And when Mark and I taught it in 2011, uh, in the spring this year, is that was the first kind of week or two is them getting in there and setting up their own spaces, their own domain, their own web host, and really running with it. So um, that was the actual conceptual kind of beginning of this class. Um, and the idea, and this is from Mark, is kind of, uh, no, from Gardner's talk, is no more digital faceless. And I know this is a very uncomfortable image. You see the little blackboard in the back, and we're in Illuminate, so I love to kind of make fun of blackboard while I'm using it, because then you can call me a hypocrite. Um, but anyway, the idea is we need to get away from these kind of well-lighted, illuminated structures. You know, like we need to have spaces that students do their work in, and then we come together synchronously or uh, asynchronously and share our work and hopefully build community on the web rather than apart from it. And so Gardner's talk was all about this. It was also nicknamed the Bags of Gold talk. And it was nicknamed the Bags of Gold talk because the, bathing, the bottom line was, you know, we've talked about all the things we can do with this new technology, all the possibilities we have with this new technology. But when it comes to it, you know, we're still basically reinventing the same wheel and we're calling it a facelift when actually it's, it's nothing more than that. It's just a basic cosmetic uh, surgery. So his whole thing was let's make it different. Let's really rethink the architecture and structure. And I think this is where Martha and I's collaboration really kind of blew some of this out of the water because we did. And Martha, in particular, rethought what this whole site is. This is actually her baby, and I'll have her talk a bit about the site, the conception of it, and hopefully move into the question of the daily habit of cre creating. So Martha, all you. So um, the site that Jim has a screenshot up here is kind of the main mother site for DS-106, and it's located, as he's got the URL there, ds106.us. Um, and it really has become an, or evolved into sort of a central hub of activity for the DS-106 experience. And so when we set out um, at the beginning of the semester last spring, um, one of the things that I wanted to tackle was building a site that really reflected that community and made it as hopefully as easy as possible to understand what's transpiring in the community and to jump into the community. Well, so to understand what's one of the things that we did, all of, all of our sites are built in WordPress, so that's all we know. Understand. One of the things um, we did, all of the So this is just a WordPress site that's installed on a web host, uh, on Jim's web hosting account, and we decided to trick it out. And, and one of the ways that we did that was um, we use a plugin for WordPress called Feed WordPress, which allows us to syndicate in content from other people's blogs. So every time you write a post on your blog, if you're or if you're syndicated into DS-106, it gets essentially republished on the DS-106 site, but it still points back to your blog because we firmly believe that you control ownership of your content. And what this site does is really just act as, to use a 1990s web metaphor, a portal <laughs> um, into, um, into your experiences and into the larger course experience. So what you're seeing here on the home page are the latest posts from people whose blogs are being syndicated into DS-106. And um, I just kind of restyled things a little to make more transparent who was talking, where the conversation was happening. Yeah. So for each post that comes in, for example, we map their Gravatar. Um, if they have one set up right there next to the post, you can see, um, you can see kind of that little avatar that shows up next to the title. We show a quick excerpt. Um, there's a continue reading bu button, which again takes you off to that person's web space. It doesn't keep you here on DS-106. We don't really care if your eyeballs wander. And then the last thing that we did, which was a nut that we've been trying to crack for a while, <laughs> we've been using this model of sort of mother blogs and children blogs in other courses at UMW for years. One of the things that people had complained to us about was that um, they couldn't tell what kind of conversation was happening on those other blogs. Um, it just felt like sort of this, this barrier um, between what they were reading here and what was happening on the other side. So I managed to code something last spring so that on every post it actually shows you how many comments have been made 
on that post at the originating blog. So it kind of becomes a, an indication of where the conversation is happening, both coming to it and saying, oh, well, look, there's been 15 comments on this blog and on this post. I want to see why everybody's talking about it, but also coming in and saying, gosh, this looks really interesting and nobody's commented on it yet. I want to give this person a little bit of comment love. Um, and that was really important to us. It, it was a way, again, to kind of help the two-way communication between the mother blog and, and the, ch the children blog, so it to speak. It was huge because we hadn't solved that yeah. comments problem. But that's not all you did. And, you know, the MOOC can be a kind of beast, as you see here. And this is by, uh, this is by Lockhart. Uh, I think it's Gordon Lockhart. And this is basically a great, this is from the CCK 2011, maybe? Yeah, CCK 11. And this is kind of the visual. And you see that the MOOC is, we did the same thing similar to uh, Downs. His grasshopper, we're basically doing with the WordPress. But something I think that we added to the MOOC that changed our, and this is all Martha, is we added the idea, and if you guys know, you don't need me to tell you what a MOOC is, right? You know that um, Downs and Siemens and Cormier basically uh, started perfecting this. It came out of, I think, something that uh, Downs, Wiley, and Siemens all had kind of imagined yeah. early on. And then we know that it got insanely big with Stanford did this artificial intelligence. And you are now taking your own CMC11, which is a MOOC dealing with a very particular kind of course. And they're blowing up all over the place, and they're fun to watch and do. One of the things we tried to do with the MOOC, um, and Martha and I had talked about this a lot and kind of imagined it, is we're not so worried about the massive because we're not massive. Um, maybe a couple of hundred people the first semester, yeah. right? But yeah. And they're dipped in and out. There was no yeah. expectation of continuity there. But it's a small community. It, yeah, it feels like a small community. Yeah. And it's very kind of localized, and we know each other on Twitter and elsewhere, and it's come that the class was a way but the ongoing creative is ha creations are happening. And every semester, something new happens, right. which is awesome. Um, but we're thinking of it as not an open educational resource, which is kind of what the open movement always kind of frames everything is, but kind of an experience. And I think the nut that really broke that experience goes to some of the things we talked about with, or you talked about with the creative habit, yeah. and the daily shoot. So one of the things that kind of drives this course design, the development of this course here at Mary Washington is that it actually meets a general education requirement. And it's the reason the majority of students here on campus take this class, is it meets a gen ed requirement for creativity. Yeah. Um, and it's taught, it's taught in the computer science department. And Jim and I are both instructional technologists. <laughs> so there's, it's kind of this interesting tension there. Um, how do you teach a class that's essentially about creativity by two people who are not artists in a department that isn't in, in the arts at all? Or even um, academic. Or even, yeah, right. <laughs> so, but I actually think, in a way, the way that we deal with creativity in DS-106 really gets at the heart of what that gen ed requirement is about. Because the notion isn't that creativity is something that only happens in studio art classes or theater classes or music classes, but that it's a general education requirement that students are expected to um, have this experience um, on a much more general holistic level as part of their education. And so how we deal with, with this in our class is that we don't go into the class um, expecting students to become artists, but we do go into the class expecting students to develop what we call the creative habit which is the notion that you practice creativity on a regular basis every day. You give yourself permission on a regular basis to explore your creative side, not because you're trying to create some precious final product, but because it's only through that daily practice that you begin to understand um, and evolve your creative self. And that, to me, is probably what that gen ed requirement is really supposed to be. I think so, yeah. <laughs> supposed to be. Um, creativity. Exactly. And, thinking about. And, and so Daily Shoot, which unfortunately has since died, um, <laughs> was a website for years run by two photographers, um, a, a photographer and a programmer, who would, on a daily basis, give out a prompt. Um, and we built this um, into the course where for two weeks or so, yeah. students were required to complete the daily shoot, so they would have to go out and take a photograph um, that met that prompt. They had to post it to Flickr. They had to tag it so that it would show up on the daily shoot site. We also had our own daily shoot aggregator on the DS-106 site, so it was a way to see what everybody was doing. And daily shoot is just a wonderful way within a class. It's, it's a funny way how it builds community, because without people even talking, by looking at the, the pictures people are taking that represent a prompt in their life on that day, yeah. suddenly you start to see connections and you start to feel a sense of community. It's amazing. Only through the, the sharing and viewing of visuals, you know. And I think when we do it again in spring, 
um, we are going to try and integrate a daily shoot that we make, hopefully, or we're, yeah, daily action. We're thinking about like a daily prompt, like a daily creative prompt. To go along with each of the different sections. But the daily shoot was key, and it's really sad that I've lost it. it is, I mean, because yeah. it gets at that whole notion of the creative habit. But it also talks to something that we, Mark and I, really experimented. And I think it's one of the coolest things yeah. about this class is this idea of networking the assignments and networking how we teach. Um, originally, when I taught this class, it was basically eight big assignments. I came up with them. They were my brainchild. They were my great assignments. And frankly, the, some of the students didn't like them. And I took that hard, you know, ego-wise. And you know, Tom Wilburn had suggested, why don't you let them choose the assignments? And so Martha and I sat down and we talked about what that might look like. And then she programmed using Google Forms, although now she has a new solution, um, how to do it. Anything about that, Martha? Because I think this yeah. is one of the coolest parts of the class. I think so too. And basic, I mean, the, the cool part isn't the programming. The cool part is what's come out of the community in this space. So we basically just opened it up to the larger DS106 community, including our students here at Mary Washington, and said, tell us an assignment. Here are the categories that we're working with. And it's like vis visual design, um, audio, video, fanfic, mashup, and web. That's right. Um, pick one of those categories. Pick a title, frame out the idea of the assignment. If you've got an example, show it to us. And then we aggregate those onto the course site so that you can browse them by those different categories. And on each page where you when you actually drill down to see an assignment, you'll see a screenshot of it and you'll see the description. We have a couple of tags that get automatically generated. And as long as you're a member of the DS106 community and contributing to this site, if you tag your post using those tags, your contribution, like your version of that assignment, actually shows up beneath the assignment description. So we end up having this kind of running history of right. what people have done to complete the assignment. So when students say, well, I'm kind of stuck, I don't know what to do, there's actually places where you can say, well, here's some examples. You can look at, and very often in the posts where people um, share their work, they also will talk about their process, because we're very process oriented in this class. That's we right. require students to narrate their process. We, in fact, we tell them that's more important than your final product. Um, so it actually becomes this incredible repository of, of resources and probably the thing that has hit home most for me is that while this is a digital storytelling class, I firmly believe that the assignments that have been submitted, and we have over 150 at this point, are applicable across so many different disciplines. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing both to see that they're, the way they submitted them, and the students started submitting them right away. It was fascinating. And then they started doing each other yeah. and talk about another way to build community in the class. I mean, I'll give you one example. Is here's what it looks like, and Martha designed all this. When the assignment, you have a kind of uh, visual, and then you have a quick description, and here's the tags, and then people can rate them. And so we have this kind of a series of assignments that people have done and then rated, and then if you click on the actual assignment, you'll see everybody who's done them. Talk about building in the community to that. Well, what's more, once people start doing them, and here's a good example of the four icon challenge. It's basically take four icons from a movie. This has a white Russian. A, a rug, a toe, and a bowling ball. And if you know what movie that is, put it in the chat. Right? And it can only be one. But the whole idea here is that you know students, and you see beneath here, other students had done them and had shared their process and what they did. So anyone assignment, you would have like 20 or 30 other students who have done them. And this class has kind of reiterated itself over three semesters. So you get like levels over each semester that students do different assignments and are excited by different assignments based upon the class. So it's really cool also to, to take it's the like the guys of, of, the, the of the class. And I always talk about this one because someone just came by and submitted this one. They had nothing to do with the class. They never took it. They never signed up. They could care less about the one They can't spell 19. They, like, they can't spell 19, <laughs> but <laughs> they signed up for this class only to do this one assignment. I call it the drive-by assignment. Cool. And then they leave. And I love it. This is for 19 or Ninfi. It's beautiful. It is. It's amazingly done. And the other thing is this assignment kind of submitted, Tim Owen submitted this kind of let's make a Valentine's Day because when we did it, it was in the spring and it happened, the class happened to fall on Valentine's Day. And so people started doing it. He put this one, we are a team, and kind of the theme of DS 106 was very love love. Yes, yes. Right? And then what happened is a student, um, <laughs> Sarah Coon, had fun with it. And she said, you know, you looked at her online. It's funny, me and Martha was like, I can't believe Superman would say that to Wonder Woman. And Martha was like, no, it's Wonder Woman who's saying it to Superman. So it's just this kind of like, the class was, you know, imbued with a certain amount of fun, especially when they started taking over the assignments. And here's a really good example. This is Colleen Tracy's yeah. The Poetry Playlist. Which is brilliant. It's a brilliant, but see, here's where I think I'm a jerk. 
is I saw this assignment when she submitted and I was kind of like, ho oh, hum, like I don't think it's that cool. And then people went nuts for it all over the so world. Sorry, but it's Portugal, so post for your list is you go into your iTunes and you pick a series of song titles and then you convert them into like a poem or a short story. And I had no idea. People love this. Everyone, like 50 students from the class did it, but then 20 other people from all over the world, Australia, Portugal, China, um, South America, all did it. And so she comes in the next week after she had submitted it and 70 people did her work, and she was beaming. I mean, it was insane that she was in many ways programming the class. She was teaching the class. And yeah. it was really cool to see that. And, and then we would have people submit an assignment like this, and then other people would iterate upon it. They'd say, well, okay, now do an album cover. For your poetry playlist, yeah. Um, so they were kind of using those assignments as a as a jumping off place for imagining their own assignments and their own. And what we started to do is we started to say, look, do a certain amount of these number of these assignments a week, and that and we have a new way. Where we're going to come up with some star system for that. But what we're basically doing is taking Martha's notion of the daily creative act and spreading it over four or five different media over 15 weeks and encouraging them to do it with examples and with a community. Yeah. And the community happened in a lot of different places, right? Um, here's all the people who did her site, and that's the po poetry her playlist. Site, yeah. And then the community broke out in some different ways with DS106 Radio, right? Right now we're on DS106 Radio, just to kind of remind you, um, hence we ever give you a chance to talk, which probably won't happen. But if you were to talk right now, you would be on the radio. And what is DS106 Radio? Well. When Martha and I were kind of framing the class um, about a month before, and uh, Tom Woodward and Alan Levine also helped us kind of think through this, we didn't really, the radio wasn't even a possibility. We didn't, we didn't even think about it. All we knew is that we didn't want to use Illuminate, right. <laughs> which is what we're right. using now. But we didn't want to use this because we felt like we didn't want it to be that classroom experience. We wanted it to be of and on the web. And we just didn't know what that meant, but uh, Alan and Martha and Tom were pretty adamant, like, let's not go there. And so what happened was, two weeks into the class, it was actually January 16th. Mm -hmm. So, no, the day January, that we'll in from yeah, January 20th, but I think that I, the tweet was like January 16th or thereabouts. It was basically like, we don't need Illuminate, we need a radio station. Did you say that? I did. Yeah, you said that. And, and Grant Potter, who was up in British Columbia, built it. Yeah. Within and like three hours. Yeah, exactly. And it was through this thing that just like emerged on Twitter and I went like I came into the office on Friday and I was like, We have a radio station now. And then we really I think one of the funnest parts and I think it's still one of the funnest classes I've ever taught is Mark and I got together with a group of students in a room, both of our classes, and we had a live radio show yeah. where they talked, we played their stuff on the radio and then they talked about what they did. Yeah. I did that, and you did that twice to great effect. And, right? and oh. the radio station came up about you know two weeks before we were launching into the audio section of the class. So it was like, yeah. if you build it, they will come. Like we just okay, now we have a platform to enact this next um, Part of our this class. next piece of our class. And so then we completely changed sort of our assignment, and we said, okay, you're going to be doing a radio show, and you're going to be broadcasting it live, and we're going to be interviewing you about your process and and they and they were some great stuff. They opened bumpers, stuff. commercials. Yeah. I mean it was really cool. But the thing is DS one they hated radio, it. They did. They hated the radio. That's the thing. The students didn't like the radio. The, everyone the else work. around the yeah. student the student like one of your the zombie radio station uh, assignment was one of the best ones and the student did this basically they were playing on the fact that they hated the assignment and hated the radio by placing themselves in a radio. Station. Yeah, they were. It was a zombie apocalypse, and they were trapped in a radio station. So anyway, but the fact is, the students didn't really use the radio after the assignments, but the radio became its own social network amongst ed tech people and beyond. And like Dr. Garcia, Julia Forsyth, um, Grant Potter, Brian Lamb, name them down the line. There's like 30, 40 people now, and they're regularly using it as this kind of inter. Active so, and part of the class comes and invades it at certain points and then leaves. But this thing is its own kind of reality. Like Grant Potter did a four-hour epic return to New York City show where he had been to New York City recently. He played all this stuff, and you know people came on and they talked to him. And it's like there's this weird kind of community happening that the radio in the class gave birth to. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily like people like are the students using it. I was like, I don't know. I mean, I think they see the value of it, but they. They're still doing a class, but they come in and out, and they're still able to do something where they know they're going to have a community and an audience. 
and that changes it. It yeah. does change the reality Absolutely. of it. So um, that's fun. And I don't know if this next one, yeah. Another good example of the radio in terms of digital storytelling creativity is we, once again, we didn't predict it, but Mikhail Gershevich and his mom and his father um, have a particular story. They came here from Riga, which was the old Soviet Union when he was eight years old in 1979. And his mother and father loved to tell the story of them. Basically, they were 39 years old, up and just start fresh um, in America and what that meant. And it's a great narrative. And they get on and they have this radio station called Radio Free Puppies where they talk about what it means to come here, you know, during the height of the Cold War, during the height of the Reagan 80s as Russians to California. And it's just a compelling place to tell your story and to share and talk about this idea of sharing ideas of culture and who we are. Um, DS-106 has been really good because I think one of the things that's really important about DS-106 as a class in general is we associate our notions of culture and identity very deeply with the music, the video, and the pop culture that we surround ourselves in. And this class really engages that. Um, and it's a real different way to think about what it means to share around culture. And it's not always just bubblegum. You know, it can seem that way, but it really no. becomes serious quite quick. Um, and then we had this radio station became the platform for people like Brian Lamb to come on like we're doing kind of now as a session and present through the radio because we had like 50 people on the radio, which is still, I think, a high mark during his session. And he presented with a series of mashup artists in interviews and cut up the show. And it was just an amazingly done show that actually showed that, you know, through this class we were thinking of different media immediately. And one of the things, I mean, how has Twitter in, informed how we do DS-106? I mean, what has been your Twitter experience is, with Twitter that? is like the lifeblood of DS-106. Without, I actually have said that without Twitter, like what happened last spring with DS-106, there's no way it would have happened. And not just because it became the channel by which everybody in DS-106 sort of informally communicates, but because when Jim originally had the idea of taking DS-106 online and creating this open online experience out of it, he reached out to his network. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the people who have come to DS-106 from outside of UMW who have heard about it, have heard about it through either because they were following Jim or because they were following somebody who was following Jim. And so I think it was really you going out, not even so much on your blog probably, but no. going out on Twitter and saying, Do talking it. about it and pointing people to the website that brought everybody into the fold. And then it became the space in which everybody kind of lived. And it was, for me, an eye-opening because I think that's true to some degree. And, you know, everyone says you're wasting all your time on Twitter and what There's a waste no for these social networks. And then it's funny, when you go out and you invite people and people are, you know, you have these relationships and you respond to people and you're kind of using it as a tool of community. Right. People do respond and en masse. Yeah. And it was really amazing. Like I said, it wasn't a massive course, but to have 200 people or 300 people sign up because you sent out a couple of tweets um, is remarkable in that, you know, the network stuff we do and which we think is unrelated to our jobs is directly and integrated into it. And DS106 became, allowed us to be that blurriness right. between it be, being our jobs and being something else and also being very social. Right. I mean, we had a bunch of people from DS106 to Fredericksburg for Bob in, in October. Right, and we had parties at our house, and it was very much as much social as it was educational, yep. and that was cool. So Twitter, we can't say, I can't say enough about how essential it's been. And if you look at the search, to, or the hashtags, DS106 or DS106 Radio, still, you'll see they're very much still active. There's yeah. probably 20 tweets on each of them today. Yeah. Um, and then, cool story. Uh, so. We DS-106 started, there was a student in DS-106 who was actually a computer science major, a senior. He knew how to program. I don't. And he basically said, you know what? I love this whole DS-106 radio thing conceptually. What you need is some sort of Twitter bot. So what he did is he invented a, or he created a Twitter bot that read the server, the song titles that were coming on the server. And basically now we have a DS-106 Twitter um, uh, what would you call it, like a, a Twitter account that's basically reading the server and showing whenever, whenever anyone goes live and what song is playing at any minute. And I think there's like 50,000 tweets <laughs> as of now. But yeah. this is amazing. And the student created it on the fly. It wasn't an assignment. It was because he could put his skills to use in order to further the class. Right. And that's amazing. It was. 
And that it's was on his own initiative. Yeah, and that like, was we got to do this. Aaron Clemmer, and here's the post he wrote about how he did it. And great people like Graham Potter, Alan Levine came in and gave him feedback. And that was an amazing aspect too of the course. Mm -hmm. And that's a great example of it of how like not not to be too humorous about this, but Jim and I didn't have to teach them. <laughs> yes, that's right. We, we had this like network of experts and professionals, some of whom were way more experienced with some of the media that we were working with than we were, who would jump in and, and help our students and give them advice. And sometimes we're able to give them feedback that was harder for us to give. Yep. I mean, there was an interesting dynamic there too. Yeah, and people could come in and be honest with them. And Aaron Klemmer, for example, I mean, Grant's the one who's given them all the information about the NiceCast server. Mm -hmm. Alan has developed, you know, numerous tools that have been useful for other people. Right. He knows what that he knows means. What, yeah. Knows the questions to ask. You know, we have different skills, but those aren't it. But when you have 50 or 60 people who aren't part of the class, who aren't doing it for a grade, and are giving your students feedback, yeah. I mean, one of the things we didn't talk about is before the class even started, yeah. 200 people had done animated gifts. Yeah. As assignment, it wasn't even an assignment. And the class, like, when our students came in, they're like, "What the hell's going on?" Yeah, we showed them this website, and we said, "You're in a course that's been going on for a month already, and there are people all over the world who are participating in it." And it was trippy. And the extent that they understood that, I don't know, but but the thing is, is once they started comment, once they started posting, and I think me and Mark are really benefiting from this. That community was riled up yeah. and ready to go, so they started so commenting right away. And so generous. Wow. Just Oh, generous with their time. And I think it just changed the way our students really thought about what this class was. And about what the web was. The notion that the web wasn't, it wasn't this thing that they were experiencing, it was thing that, this thing they were creating. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's really well put. So we went on. Aaron actually also, as a little bonus, he, he took that bags of gold thing from Gardner's talk and he created a video game. And the video game is called The Beneath, and it was basically like a video game about how to escape Blackboard. So you had these bags of gold, but ultimately you were trying to get out of the dungeon that was Blackboard, which was kind of something that came up again and again in the class. And Gardner Campbell really kind of inspired some students to do some crazy stuff. Tim Owens, TF106 yeah. TV. And now we're really seeing the fruits of that almost a year later. Well, we have him working for us. So. Yes, we have him working for us, A, and that's a great story. Yeah. Right? What, do you, what do you think about that? Well, what a way to find a job. And what a way to find a person who's awesome, who's awesome to work in your division. You know, like He took the S106. Took, we didn't know him. Yeah, we didn't know him. He was. And then he applied for this job. And it was like, wow, this like, guy's great. Yeah, and we saw his work. And so yeah. we had him talk during the design. He's a great designer. And we said, hey, you know, come. Uh, do DS-106, and then when we had a job open up, we said, why don't you apply? He's like, no, I don't have the experience, you know, I'm fixing computers here in Longwood. I was like, are you kidding me? And then here he is with us, and he actually has brought out the, the, the TV stuff. This is the first broadcast by Todd Conway, who was awesome, and he broadcast from the Grand Canyon when it was yeah. snowing. <laughs> and so that was the first, now the TV happened about mid-semester, so it didn't take root during the spring. Yeah. But it did take root oh, during the summer. And we'll talk about that in a second. We're going to get there to the summer of oblivion. So, and then Tim actually and Andy really are the, are the principals behind our new TV show from DTLT, which is our group, the Division of Teaching and Learning Technologies. And we do a 15 minute show every day. And we try and schedule it when Mark is not around. Absolutely, which is awesome. <laughs> and then they can talk about things without my expertise. And that which is, is why it's not as good as it's Awesome, exactly. And that's live TV that we're actually hosting and there's no commercials. That's right. And we could probably do a whole other session cool. about that. Yeah. But we'll leave that alone. Um, and then we had the Minecraft server that yeah. people which, got in there and experimented with. Which never really took off as a core piece of the course, but boy, did we have people building things. Right. I mean, I love that. Like, we never built it into the course, but it became something people did. Especially over the summer, like, students just got in there and started really yeah. building stuff out. And you, too. You loved it. I you were in there more than me. Yeah. Um, and then, <laughs> the pen. Uh, now, this is to say, you know, we had two courses going on this summer. We had a face-to-face -face course and an online course. I taught the face-to-face -face course. Exactly. And the face-to-face -face course, I want to talk about that quickly because the radio show you guys did, everyone sat around the table, they did their shows, and you had some of the best, I think, assignments I've ever heard come out of that class. It was an amazing class. It was a great group. But we had this amazing radio show, and then a student's father. Yeah, that's right. Called him from China over the radio. Yeah. He Skyped in because he was working over in China and he was listening. It was, I don't know what time. Yeah, it must have been like 2 But in the he morning. had told him about it and he tuned in from China and he called in and we talked to him about 
about the course and about sure. her experience in the course, and it was fantastic. And he was talking about how cool it was to be able to tune in yeah. to be radio and listen to him, his daughter, and her peers. Talk, not only share their work, but then talk about how they created it and what it meant. And, yeah. and, and that's really good, and that's a piece of gold we yeah. have from that semester. And so Martha was done. She was very kind. Um, but then we started this thing called the Summer of Oblivion. And it was an idea I had based on a David Cronenberg movie. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Videodrome. If you're not a Cronenberg fan, you should be. And the video is, Videodrome is basically, uh, it's a crazy movie. I won't talk about it at all because it deals with like, you know, snuff films and stuff like that. But the point highly I want to, is highly inappropriate for people who aren't highly inappropriate. Um, but one of the things to think about is there's this character based on Marshall McLuhan because David Cronenberg actually is a Canadian and he went to school. He was a student of uh, McLuhan's. And basically, um, Dr. Oblivion is a character in this film and Dr. Oblivion's whole thing is he's never seen anyone face to face for 27 years. He's only ever been mediated by the television. And this <laughs> is like 1982, 84? Maybe yeah. four, maybe early five. Early 80s. Early 80s. Yeah. And so it was all TV because it wasn't really dealing with the web yet. Right. So the idea is, I'm teaching this fully online course, why not treat myself like I'm a character, Dr. Oblivion, and I've never been face to face with anyone for 27 years, and I've only used the web to teach um, students, only ever. And so what happened was, I woke up one morning, I shaved my head, I shaved my beard, and I walked into work as Dr. Oblivion. And no one at work recognized me, my wife was like, what the hell's happening? I mean, it was really like a radical shift in my identity. And it kind of freaked me out. Um, and so by day three, I did this. By day three, I, I stopped the, the, the lecture and I was like, this sucks. I, and I got off air and I said, very, Mark, very, I said, this yeah. sucks. I can't do it. I you suck. Cut short. You were really, yeah, you were very upset. I didn't know what to do. And so basically, Martha and I came up with the idea, and Lee, who's a student aide, came up with the idea of uh, we would have him go missing. Yeah. And that was a way of me dealing with the existential identity crisis. Like we keep Saturday. pushing out of the <laughs> So he went, he went away, and then Jim Groom, the TA, came back and started teaching the course. And with the subtext that now we had a missing Dr. Oblivion, and what had happened to him, and yeah. where had he gone. That's right. And so we started to become kind of TV writers. Yeah. And so people started putting up signs all over the right world. Right in the middle of the country. Doing design assignment. So we, the first assignment was. And this is done by Michael Branson Smith, who's a genius. And he put this up with a bunch of people in New York City physically, because they were up there. And so we started to have fun with it. And then students started to do reports. And I wish I could show this video, but Blackboard won't let me. But Alan Liddell, who's a student and who works for us now, but was also in DS-106, did these great news on the march, yeah. which basically was a recap of what happened. And it was like a 1940s style Yeah, it was like, news real. on the march. Actionalism breaks DS-106. And the point is, is that Jim Groom kind of started to go crazy. And he banished students from the class. Yeah. And the students reacted and they said, we don't want to be part of your class anymore. We're going to create our own class called DS-107. And that's what this video. And so what we had is a real kind of like, you know, narrative starting to emerge within the class. So if the class is about digital storytelling, but through the online mechanism and kind of freeing it of these kind of tools, we were able to do a narrative on a regular basis. We would come in and say, what are we going to do? And it was completely How are we multimodal. Do it? I mean, it was like pieces of the narrative would, would it was also completely unengineered. We didn't have a master story. So every day it was like, well, who's going to throw a wrench into the story today and where is it going to come from? Is it going to be a post on someone's blog? Is it going to be a new Twitter account? Um, is it going to be a viral video? It was um, amazing. And it was some of the most fun I've ever had. And so to speak to that next point, we used something called Storify to bring the tweets and the videos all together. And this is, once again, Michael Branson Smith. He actually Storified the entire rebellion being known as the DS-107 Rebellion, and that kind of framed students that they were part of the narrative, they were helping create the narrative, but Martha also called it probably the most immersive art-like class you could imagine because we hadn't planned anything. It was just emerging and the students were determining where it went. Well, that whole idea of emergent gaming, this is like emergent education. I mean, yeah. It's like there was no... It was awesome. Yeah. And then other people started to become Dr. Oblivion. This is our colleague, Andy Rush, who did a session on video. And over time, in between the sections of his PowerPoint, he became more and more like the Dr. Oblivion. 
which is a great kind of idea of how much fun we had with this. And then Martha, see Martha, how could, would you explain the fact? So Martha, if I were to bring you up to date, Martha became the TA when Jim Groom was banished because he was ultimately went missing so yeah. after Oblivion went missing. So I volunteered to step in and then, you know, and save the class. Because save I've taught the S106 before and yeah. I have some expertise, so okay, I'm not getting paid, yeah. I'm not really supposed to be. So you were like, okay, here I come, I'm going to save the class. But what basically happened, and people didn't know, is that Martha Burtis had taken Dr. Oblivion and Jim Groom and hit him in some camp out in the woods and was torturing. Well, really, it's like they say about how like TV shows jump the shark. We did Yeah, jump the shark. like that last week, like you can see in the back of the screen <laughs> wasn't working anymore, so we just drew a backdrop. But you have no idea how intensive this was for five weeks. So yeah. by week five, we, we were shocked. Yeah. And so Martha Burtis was arrested and put in there, and she had killed many of the students as well as tried to kill Dr. Oblivion and Jim Boone, but they survived. And that's how that ended. And that's it. That was the end. And it was probably the single greatest thing I think I've ever been a part of in terms of a class. But what happened was DS-106 didn't end there. Neither Martha nor myself taught it in the spring in the or in the fall. But what happened was it went on. Michael Branson Smith, um, well, based on the model, I don't know if any of you know of the Looking for Women model, it was the idea that a course was being taught at five different institutions. And each of them were teaching it differently, but they were still basically sharing and um, having students kind of read and respond to each other's work. Well, DS-106 kind of took the same logic. And this is Michael Branson Smith in New York City who's rocking out. Um, and Are you playing the triangle back there? I am playing the triangle. <laughs> and what he did is he actually started with his class at York College in a CUNY, um, City University of New York. And he has 80 students who are taking it, and they're using the DS-106 site. All their stuff is going in. And once again, they get access to the community. And then the great Scott Lowe, or Scott Lockman, is also teaching a class of 40 students um, going through DS-106, and his students are in Japan. And the fact that we have students from now New York City, which is probably one of the most diverse places in the world, in Japan, taking this class and bringing their particular yeah. notions of culture to the DS-106 community, I think has only made it that much right. cooler. And so, and there's no notion that what they're doing is the same class that Jim and I taught. No. Because it's it's not. But what DS106 does afford them is sort of a community and a space yeah. um, and a conversation to kind of envelop. And it gives the them class that they are teaching. a whole series of assignments to ask their students a to do. But also, we had tons of students in Japan and in New York City add assignments. Mm -hmm. So now we have this Even kind of more. growing resource. And so I think when we talk about creativity and multiculturalism, DS-106 has kind of been a real interesting example of how when you open up something, when you let people kind of help you program, develop, and teach a class, um, you only really open up the possibilities of creativity for yourself, but also for your students, but also of being exposed to a completely new range of culture, well, whether it's local culture or international culture, that really just blows your mind. And it allows people to discuss and learn and communicate around that culture that's important to them. And I do think that's really important um, in terms of DS-106. Absolutely. How about you? What you said. Yeah. yeah, no. Okay. So that's our official presentation. We tried to keep it to the 45 minute mark, and we had that very much planned. We plan everything. Um, but what we want to do now is we want to turn the microphone off on us and turn the microphone on on you, and hopefully you have something to share with us. And that was Scott Lowe's class. Um, but if you have questions, let me go back to slide one. It would just be the DS106 hashtag. If you have any questions, any issues, um, things you'd like to know about the class, we are taking questions now. So let us know. Jim, I'm going to start it off with a semi non sequitur. Um, I was watching the video by the young woman who had done the blogging while she was uh, taking a course in Australia, I believe it was. And I was not aware that DS-106 had a basically open blog for all students. And I'm wondering if you could address that a little bit. See, DS-106 doesn't have an open blog for all students in the same way you might think. Students are forced, um, or actually encouraged, to go out and get their own web host and domain and set up their own blog. And then what we do is bring it in. Student Valerie, the student you're talking about who is blogging in Australia, 
actually had a blog in UMW Blogs. And we could easily have said, Martha and I, hey, go get a blog in UMW Blogs and we'll pull it in. But we very much wanted this class to be about them getting their own space, thinking about it. And even if they don't keep it after the end of the class, um, they have to archive it and they have to think about what it means to archive their work. And uh, we really made that a kind of a requirement, a requirement. and a foundational piece. And it's, it's sort of, I have to admit, when I first started teaching the class and Jim had taught it this way face to face before, I was like, well, oh, you know, am I going to be able to make sense of why exactly we're having them do this? But after doing it, it was so obvious that this had to be the foundational piece. That the only way to get them to the place where they really were starting to feel some ownership and some sense of investment yeah. in in the web as, as a platform for storytelling and for sharing narrative and for being part of a community was to have their own home in it. Yeah. And the fact is, is there's a lot of students who after the classes do, do give it up and you feel a little bit like, oh really? Yeah. Maybe that was I like, found somewhere. But that's not the case. And it's not the point really. It's the point is to yeah. get them in there and learn how to do it and figure out how to do it. And understand what's behind all of it. And it, could, yeah. it will be practically beneficial for them. And it's also conceptually for them to start thinking about what is a database? What's held in a ba database? Where is all my information? Right. Why do people complain about databases in Facebook? Oh, because I can't access those. Why do they complain about databases in Twitter? Oh, because I can't access those. Um, and that's for us to start thinking about them being digital kind of, you know, stewards of their work and starting to think critically about what it means to manage your own work, which kind of brings, I think, DS106 as a class um, into some really thoughtful conversations with the FERPA conversations. Uh, the FERPA, uh, I know it's not even a conversation, it's more like a fear right now that's happening in higher ed. And, I think DS-106 is designed to deal with that. You're going to be teaching a class next semester, Martha, that's going to deal even more specifically with that. So she's breaking off from DS-106. She's done with us. She wants something new. Um, and you're going to teach a class on digital identity. Identity and citizenship in the digital age. Which I think is a really a, an outgrowth of what we were trying to get at to some degree, that's even right. basically in DS-106. Mm -hmm. This class is about digital identity. It's about framing yourself online. And it's about using the idea of expression because how you communicate with other people in the media and the web is through an expression of who you are. And we think that's part of storytelling. You know, we don't approach storytelling in a kind of very pedantic way. It's not any one way. It's a form of expression that you use to communicate with others. And given such a wide range of interpretations that might mean, we have opened up the, the assignments for people to kind of fill that. And that has been awesome because right. we have allowed that interpretation not only for you to say, oh, you can get your voice in when you say what it is, but no, you can um, exemplify it through an assignment that you do. Right. So does that answer your question, uh, Carol, or get to uh, the point? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> but I'll get back to that. Um, there are some questions in the chat box. Betty just asked one. Do you want me to read it or can you see that? Okay. I was, I was just going to say. Oops, oops. Okay. We are on the chat. Thank you. Um, and Betty, um, I'm going to let uh, Martha speak to your question about whether so, it's going to be open. Uh, I'm not planning on, on offering that digital identity identity class quite in the same way as DS-106, in part because it's the first time it's been taught, the first time I've taught it, and the first time it's been taught at all. Um, but I'm absolutely certain that the work my students are going to be doing and the course um, presence itself will be open and online. Um, so I, I, it's a good question. I haven't really thought about whether or not um, you should. I should. Yeah, I know he thinks I should. I do. And I think we should work it so that yeah. we work together in DS-106 to heighten that community too. Yeah. Um, and I know it's the first time teaching it and that's never clear. I mean, but you've already proven right. that you've done, you did DS-106 probably the most insane class you can imagine as your first time teaching as an open online class. Well, it worked out very well. You did it open online, not I just sort of We did it together. Online. I mean, yeah. um, but other questions. I mean, we're, yeah. reading, we're reading the chat. Um, FERPA. We, we really deal with um, FERPA as just what we talked about. We want to give students control of their data so we're not in the situation of being the long-term um, custodian of their work. Because the stuff with uh, Georgia Tech we've all heard about was a student who years later said, look, I want that stuff off. I don't like what's written about me on the web on that site. How can I do it? I don't have a password. I can't control my data. And then the lawyer said, that's a FERPA violation. 
bam, they took all the old stuff off and they're redoing it. I want to be in a situation that we build an architecture where students have control of that data. We don't. What we're able to do is push it where it goes and own it. And I want them to have a thoughtful idea of what it means to when you sign up with all these accounts, whether they're on a campus or off, what it means and who's owning what about you and how important it is for you to think critically about this rather for us to make a governmental or kind of, you know, some sort of executive decision about this is going to change teaching and learning on the web forever. Because it's dangerous. We well, and, I, and I think that um, I, I, I personally think, and I think this is what you've said as well, Jim, that, that to really get at what I, what I believe FERPA is trying to do, um, although rather um, bat, badly both in, in terms of how it's been enacted and understood, is, is getting students um, to understand what it is they are doing online and what it is they own and what it is they don't own and how to make choices yeah. about what they put out there um, and what kinds of tools they use because of their concerns about privacy or ownership. Um, or future implications. And we don't talk nearly enough about that in higher education right now. Yeah. Um, and I wish that instead of always saying, oh, FERPA is this, is this thing that we're all afraid of and so we need to like tighten up and lock down, batten down the hatches, instead we use this as an opportunity to have a much more open conversation about raising awareness about digital identity and what our students are doing. So. And I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I do think that um, we need to have a conversation on campus. We can't let this be um, designated and, and legislated um, out of our hands as uh, a teaching and learning community. And the fact is, is the interpretation is so wide open. And I see some questions about e-portfolios. Well, we imagine you may advise with some of that, although we don't call it an e-portfolio, because when you start calling anything an e-portfolio, it means a million different things to a million different people, whether it's analytics, whether it's about, you know, departmental assessment, and we want to stay away from that. Like Martha could speak about it. I know she doesn't want to, but we're dealing with that right now. And, you know, I want to stay away from that for right now until we have a clear idea that e-portfolios means what we want it to be, which is curricular change for teaching and learning, not about assessment and numbers. Um, and I think the two can go hand in hand, but not until the curriculum is changed to reflect what is new about this new medium. And that also means that the laws that people have litigated since 1974 also have to reflect right. what this new medium right. means that's, teaching and learning. That's a huge, part, a of huge part of that. But again, rather than leading this conversation in higher education um, and, and asserting our own um, authority and position and expertise, yeah. Um, as people who work with people, with students who have emerging identities yeah. <laughs> and are struggling with these issues, rather than saying, oh, we need to take a real ownership over this issue and be leaders, what we have increasingly done on this issue is become um, fearful yeah. and reactionary. Which is the state of the university I just over the last 10 yeah. or 15 years about everything. Copyright, fair use, I mean, you name it. We have become reactionary, we've become paper pushers, we've become bureaucrats, and we've basically been willing to uh, cower at the thought of a, of a lawsuit no. on, on just about anything. No. And I think that just shows you just our business mentality. We weren't designed to do business in the same way as businesses, mm -hmm. so we're not as good as it. Yeah. And, and we don't necessarily, sh I don't think we necessarily we should, should be. We shouldn't have to, <laughs> but we're, we put ourselves in that situation financially and elsewhere. And, I just think it's sad. I mean, and I hope that we get the, uh, I don't want to say what I want to say, chutzpah, right? I hope, you know, hope we get the cojones <laughs> and the courage, the courage to basically be like, you know what, here's what we are, here's what we stand for, here's why we're doing it, you know. And uh, Somebody wants to know about anybody blogs. You and they blogs. I'm, you know anything about that? Maybe. <laughs> what are you and they? No. You and they blogs, I mean, in many ways, so much of our experimentation here at Mary Washington has come out of that platform. And I think DS106 is a kind of offshoot of that conceptual thinking about platforms that we've done. And I think DS, the only advice is a great example of a platform that tries to make the student far more in control of their teaching and learning than we are. Um, and I think that's the model I really like about it. Um, it really does make the students an administrator over their work and they can take it with them when they go, which is a kind of new notion of architecture. Um, and so UNA Blogs is basically that. It's an open student published platform that we run about 70 or 80 classes through a year, but it's not limited to classes. It deals with academic, I mean, uh, student sites, club sites, personal portfolios, personal um, websites for faculty, um, uh, 
what else? Uh, club sites. I mean, you name it. We have like six thousand sites, uh, seven or eight thousand users. I mean, it's 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 just become a place for people to publish online easily. That's all it is. And we put no limits on who can use it or when. That's why I think it's successful. Um, frankly. Um, I'm just looking back through questions. We we didn't have this chat open earlier, and I guess there were some questions about um, about making the technology student and user friendly, yeah. about um, students not struggling, about the, the notion of students struggling with technology and that interfering with the pedagogy. Do you want to talk a little bit about? Um, yeah, I mean, I think actually the struggle with the the technology students, especially in the summer class, but usually in the in the semester, semester hate me when I say you have to set this up. They curse me. They say this, that, and the other thing. But the fact is, is you know, it's like you know, this is a crucial part of what it means to be on the web. And you know, like they start talking about, yeah, we understand the web. We we are the web. Blah 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 blah. But when you ask them some basic questions about what is a database, how do you map a domain, how does a domain work, how does a database work, how does what you have in the domain link up to all that information you serve, what does it mean to install your own application? These are things that I think for anyone who has some idea of the web um, is a conceptual at least understanding, but to see how it actually works and to execute that, the first two or three weeks is really kind of a crash course in basic web. You know, I talk about the LAMP environment, we talk about open source applications, we talk yeah. about domains, DNS, and we really try and get people up and running quickly. Because I found, you know, back in 2003 or 2002 when I first got my own LAMP environment, and I first started experimenting with my own domain, I learned a ton yeah. over the course of about six months of how to do it and how to manage it. And it was huge in me getting a job doing what I'm doing now. And I did not, was never trained in this field or in any kind of technology. Well, and the other piece of this is, I mean, part of it is it's the, an aspect of this class, but obviously this class forces, requires students to make use of a wide range of media and technology and tools yeah. And quite frankly, neither Jim nor I, as we've already admitted, are experts in all of those or even most of them. Yeah. Um, and so I've had students, I particularly had one student this summer um, who was really frustrated by this and kept saying, well, why can't you just give me steps? Like, why can't you just give me the step-by-step -step instructions of how to do this assignment? And yeah. I said to her, I'm not going to do that. And the reason I'm not going to do that is not because I'm really, really mean. <laughs> um, it's because I could give you steps today. And next week, that product could be gone, or it could have had a version update that completely changes what you have to do, or you could decide that you don't really like it and you want to use a different tool. And so those steps are completely ephemeral. And I'm not doing you any service, especially in a class like this, to give you instructions on how to work through this. Yeah. What I can do is help you to learn how to find help for yourself, and more importantly maybe, we are very honest with our students in terms of how we assess them and grade them that, as I said earlier, process is as important to us as a product. And so if we have a student who's really struggling with a technology and an assignment, what we tell them is blog about it. Yeah. <laughs> Don't just sit in your dorm room or your house getting more and more frustrated and angry with us. Yeah. Put up a post explaining the difficulty you're having, how you've tried to solve the problem, um, uh, Sorry, a phone is ringing here and it's distracting me. Um, how you tried to solve the problem, what kind of help you could use, where you've looked for help, and oftentimes somebody else in the DS106 community will come in and give you that help. That's right. um, but more importantly, it also is an indication to me that you're, you're trying to learn this. And I get to see how your mind is working and what you're yeah. struggling with and maybe even interview myself and say, have you tried this or here's a person who might be able to help you. And, and that's to me, that is so much more important than them being able to give me this perfect, precious audio file or video file or, or image file at the end of a project. And what's great, too, is that there's no hiding. And I right. love that. Like when someone says to me, well, da, 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 I just go back to their blog or their Twitter and I say, really? You've never communicated this to me, hence, fail. Like, I, I don't have, like, I don't have the patience or the wherewithal to be like, you couldn't figure it out, so you cried in your room. It's like, really? Right. No. This is a community. No one can yeah. figure it out. And so we, we break them of that quick. And it's yeah. great because the tech seems so stressful and so hardcore and they get so freaked out, at least most of them, that the rest of the stuff all seems yeah. like candy. So by the end of the semester, we're like gold. Yeah. Um, but and it is a hardcore couple of And weeks. we'll even have students who will turn in the best 
you know, submission for an assignment that we've ever seen, and they're thinking, you know, this yeah. is amazing, and our response back to them will be, but how did you do it? Yeah, exactly. You know, I, that's great. I love that you did it. It's amazing, but how did you do it? Tell yeah. us how you did it. And how can we really assess what you did? Yeah. I mean, and I don't mean assess in the in the kind of like numbers way. I mean like really like when you read someone's blog, when you read, when you get a sense of someone, you want to know their process. You want to know their thinking. Right. You want to get to know them. Right. And that's a part of that question of identity and sharing and being a good kind of, I think, comrade on the way. Right. So I actually have an appointment that I'm late for now at <laughs> 1 o'clock. Um, so Carol, I don't mean to, and I'm going to stay here. I'm going to, I'm going to leave Martha here to answer any more questions. Is that fine? That's great, Jim. Thank you so much for the time you did um, give us. It was really terrific. Um, are there any more questions that we can throw at Martha? Otherwise, we, we should release Martha as well, because she's done such a terrific job. A few are typing, Carol. Okay, I, okay, I, see, I them see, see them now. Okay. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye. And when you're finished, if you could leave the room so we can close out the recording, that'll be great. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Martha. Terrific. Thank you.